welcome back to the latest episode of the Roker Report. You're joining us off the back of another defeat. Uh, thought we might have something better to talk about, but apparently not. Yeah, Middlesbrough beat us 1-0 in what they consider to be a derby, but most Sunderland fans don't. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why we didn't put up any kind of fight. Stockdale and McKinley in charge, possibly just for that one match. Awful, awful team selection, in my opinion. Uh, today, though, we'll talk about it all. We've got Michael Graham joining me. We've got Fish Face with us. And we've got Gav. How are you guys doing? Yeah, I'm not good. bad, man. Not yeah. bad. Good stuff. Well, yes, obviously the Borough game yesterday. First of all, let me ask you both one at a time. Who believes that was a derby? Does that put any fire in your belly, that match, Middlesbrough, Sunderland? When I was a kid, I used to feel a lot more passionate about it, I think. Particularly when we had a team which I felt went out and tried their best in every game under Peter Reid. And even when we played them under Roy Keane, I remember we drew two all and scored a late win and it was Liam Miller's volley, which, you know sent us away happy that day it certainly felt like a win even though it wasn't but these days I mean no I don't feel anything for the fixture I think my association with, with Middlesbrough as a place is very loose I don't live anywhere near for a start I don't know any Borough fans whereas when it comes to Newcastle on Derby Day most of my mates are mags people that work with are mags you know what I mean so mm. that's what I consider a Derby because there's a lot more needle involved in that game but no and that, I, I agree with what you said maybe that's part of the reason why we don't turn up against them because it to them it certainly is a derby and there's a little bit more involved in it with them because you know they don't have a great deal of um rivalry with any club really so mm. when when it comes to playing Sunderland you know they at least put their all into it whereas we just do mm. I mean yesterday you've seen it uh, we just didn't put very much effort in at all and that, I think that's maybe why we lost mm. what about you Michael yeah just the same really as Gav I mean except I've I've supported the club for, for 30 years now and I've never cared about them I've never seen it as a derby <laughs> it's just there you go. it's just any other team it could have literally been any other team like the build, there wasn't the same kind of nervous stomach before the game or the shits or, you know, mm. or whatever comes with a derby. It was just any other game. I don't know. I'd get that with every fucking game, let alone a derby. Christ. <laughs> just before a match, my stomach churns. And normally about half an hour before a match, I, fucking, I get butterflies in that. My stomach turns over. And then about an hour later, I realise why. It's probably because I'm prophetic and I just, I, I can see the future. Right. Uh, mm. So 1 0. We lost 1 0, which was. Uh, bit of a stinker I mean the entire game was it was slow it was a bit dull both teams were a bit naff to be honest I thought their keeper made some fantastic saves uh, only three of them though to be fair and that was all in the first half Randolph I think is a great keeper I've always rated him anyway but we didn't ever seem to really take hold of the game did we we never really seemed to grab it by the ball so to speak our efforts and particularly even Graban's efforts you can tell with Graban that he really is trying to fill that poacher's role can't you that, I mean not like he had much choice let's talk about the team selection for a second so we ended up lining up with essentially nine defensive players. We ended up with our only outlet creatively being Aidan McGeady. And it's this, something that I specifically want to talk about, this idea. I mean, I know we've only got Stockdale and McKinley in charge for that one game, hopefully. But it, it, it's, it was a prevalent idea in the dressing room before that, that McGeady, essentially since he came in, that McGeady's the sort of, he's the coin we can rely on, you know. He's, he's, he's the one we can bet on. And I don't think that's a anything less than a dangerous game to play. Yes, he's got some talent, but uh, he's old. <laughs> he's not old. I mean, that's unfair, but he's he's on the wrong side of 30. His pace isn't what it was. There's a reason we got him for so cheap. One of my other concerns about Aidan McGeady is that it seems that Simon Grayson, the late Simon Grayson, actually brought him in personally. There, there was a connection there. He worked with him at Preston. I'm just wondering how he feels about all this in general. And when you, he's essentially, we're trying to make him our talisman at the moment. And I don't know how much he's going to be up for it. Do you know what I mean? What do you think of that, Gav? Is certainly the idea that we rely on Aidan McGeady. We were certainly doing that yesterday anyway. That can't be the way forward. Yeah, his last six games or so, he hasn't really played that well, to be honest. But I think a lot of that's to do with the, the overall confidence of the team. You can imagine what a, a confident Aidan McGeady would bring to a side like ours if the rest of the team aren't performing. And, and like you say, we're relying heavily upon him to, to bring you know individual pieces of quality during games when we're really not in them. Um, then it's, event, it's going to bottom out eventually because you've got to remember we're a championship club. He's a championship player and inconsistency comes with that really I, mm. talking about talking about the team selection I, on first view when I, I looked at it and I thought Christ what is that and then I, and then I kind of looked at it a bit longer and I thought well I can sort of say the idea we concede loads of goals and to that extent you can probably say it was a it was a success because we conceded three against Bolton and one against Borough but I, I guess that it was never going to be anything other than what it was that result because we had so much I don't know what you put it really there, there wasn't a lot of guile there there wasn't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of creativity and I just feel that 
that's what stifled us in the end. Um, I thought Didier and Dong looked good on the right, actually. I, I, he played a couple of times there early last season under Moyes. I think he played there away at QPR in the Cup and maybe played the week after as well. Pretty much the same sort of role. It was like a wide central midfield role where he was also required to you know get down the byline and try and deliver some crosses in the box. I thought he actually looked quite good. That was probably one of his better performances this season. Then he went off and we mm. struggled massively, I felt. I do feel though that although that shape suited and Dong, it didn't suit Paddy McNair at all. Uh, I thought he was very well. He wasn't even in the game really. I, I wouldn't say he was poor. He just wasn't really involved because he was asked to play like on a wide in a wide left position, which doesn't really suit him. I think he's more of a number ten or even a deep ally in midfielder. He can play both those roles pretty well. Left hand side, I'm not so sure about that. And I think it. I think really the the shape of the team stifled us from a creative sense because we had nobody around grabbing. Uh, when we did get forward more than one occasion, I noted that there was nobody in the box. Uh, there was a couple of times that Oviedo got down the left-hand side and Matthews got down the right-hand side and there was just nobody to hit in the box other than grabbing. Yeah. And when you look at the, the options on the bench, you see uh, Honeyman, Gooch, McManaman, Williams. I just felt that, in hindsight anyways, and obviously hindsight's great, I felt that a more attacking lineup with maybe one of those local lads in, I say a local lad, but Gooch come through the academy certainly, um, plays with his heart and his sleeve and he did so in this fixture last year when we played them at Stadium of Light. I just feel maybe one or two of those in the lineup might have given us a little bit more energy and maybe if the if the game plan was to be solid, players like Gooch and, and Honeyman, I know Honeyman came out and didn't play particularly well, but players like that, maybe one or two of those on the pitch might have just given us a little bit of a boost, especially later in the game when backs were against the wall and you saw the likes of Catamole and Gibson just completely devoid of energy, uh, effort and work rate. Mm. I, I felt that maybe having a couple of players on there that know what this fixture is about uh, or even know how the fans are feeling because I do I get a sense from this group of players that they don't understand what's going on really. Uh, they're, they're kind of in a bubble and they mm. go away on a Saturday and they're just not in tune with the fan base and the fact that we're bottom of the league doesn't seem to be enough to motivate these players to do better because at 1-0 that game was certainly there for taking Borough weren't that good I know they're in the playoff spot but they aren't anything special there, there were very few special teams in this league if any mm. and we aren't able to get that second wind and you know take the game by the scruff of the neck you would expect players like Lee Catamull to do that and well we're just not seeing it and I think that's on a more rounded point I think that whoever comes in next has got a real issue but that you know this core group of players like the Catamole etc they're just not able to get themselves up anymore for the big games especially when we're, we're, we're back out down the bottom of the league and whoever comes in has got to recognise what a problem what the main problem is within that squad and remove it as soon as possible as soon as January comes around we need to make massive decisions on players in my eyes the likes of Catamole if there's anybody interested in taking that bloke off our hands he's got to go and I, and I, I say that through great teeth because you know I've been a big fan of Catamole for a long time now but I'm just starting to sense that he's maybe a bigger issue here than some of the rest of the players are. And I've got to, you know, concede that maybe a, a leadership change is needed within the group for any sort of turnaround to occur because I'd like to cut more than she have been here for too long now in my eyes. It's not the first time we've speculated about it. It's not the first time anyone's brought it up. There is an odd um, equivalence between the fact that the two longest serving players also seem to be the two most underperforming players. And from all accounts, they're the players that have the most influence in the dressing room. So they'll influence any new signings. They'll influence all the younger lads that you're talking about. So, yeah, it, it is a serious concern, something that I think people should point at. It's just that older group of players, you know, even Gibson's not been here that long, but I get the same feeling from him. Just It's just, uh, there's a there's a real um, malaise about those players and the attitude of the squad. And just, you know, they're so used to losing that. I don't even believe that they've got it within them to pick themselves up. Uh, I mean, the, you know. the thing is, we're talking about, like, uh, it's a great idea because I, I never even considered these players when it comes to the idea of January sales. So you've sort of given me this weird kind of optimism now that whoever comes in is going to get rid of Camel, O'Shea, Gibson. Can you imagine if they all went out in one go and we actually managed to get money for them? No, that would be amazing. <laughs> what a fantastic January that would be. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what about you, Michael? Oh, you must have a lot to say on the subject. You were, Obviously, you watched the Borough game, but also not just that, but if you can expand on this idea, what we're talking about, about players like bad eggs in the dressing room. Um, I had I had no real issue with the team selection at all, I think. I mean, I was on the pod like last week and I said that the most annoying thing for me is that we haven't actually tried to do anything to fix the fact that we're leaking goal so much we haven't tried to play a more a compact way or you know whatever it needs to be and there wasn't a kind of a, a, a real effort made that you could see and pinpoint and I think that this week there actually was mm. you know so I mean when 
he could go away to a, a good side who are in like good form. I, I don't see any issue with playing a more a compact system. And to be perfectly honest, we should have been a one goal up. You know, we it should have been a case of we took a like lead and then we could have, you know, seen what we had in terms of could we hold on, what was the a team selection really like? Because that was the kind of like plan. It was to to uh, keep it tight, make it hard and nick a goal. And that was it. And the frustration is that, you know, you set up in that way, which mm. for me was the right thing to do. And then a Billy Jones goes to sleep and will concede a soft goal at a bad time, which has become the bane of this club's existence, like far mm. as I'm concerned. It's it's the type of goals that we concede at the times that we actually do it. You know, how many times have we seen at home this season where we've created a really good chance? And we've missed it because, you know, that's what we do. But we create the chance and that should be a kind of like a little impetus to kind of like have a good spell in the game and a turn the screw. And instead, we just get wide open at the back and they go straight up the other end and score. And then suddenly the game changes like that. And that's exactly what happens here. I've said in the past that at the back, we're too easy to run off and we fall asleep. And that's exactly what happened. You know, O'Shea was run off far too easily. They got in behind. And then Billy Jones was just, I mean, I, I don't know what he was doing, to be really honest. You know, he's an experienced player and he's been comprehensively outthought by an absolute rookie. And that's the issue at the mm. club. It's, it's that lack of professionalism. And, you know, I think that if we're talking about this core, I think that you have to put Jones in there because, you know, how often... Um, I was saying every single week that Billy Jones has made a stupid error. He's been mm. not thinking. He's been lazy. He just, and he hasn't looked fit. And, you know, all of these things just point to the fact that he's one of these uh, bad eggs. You know, I'm, I don't actually know. I mean, I'm, there are uh, uh, criticisms of him on um, social media and, uh, and then like all of this, but I don't actually know how he gets off so lightly. And I don't know how he survives manager after manager after manager. It seems and to be the position. It seems to be the role that he plays because, I mean, one of our longest serving players there, right back, mm. well, of you know, recent years, like Phil Bardsley. Yeah. Thinking about him, is, is he actually that much better than Jones? Because although, yeah, I would say, I would argue that he's slightly better than Jones. They're, they're pretty comparable, I would say. I think it's an interesting point because I don't think we've ever been spoiled for choice at right back yeah. or left back, apart from when I we would, had Alonso, maybe. I would agree but, with um, you there. And the thing is that we allow balls to, to enter our box far too easily. Mm. Far too easy, no matter who's there. And I know that there's a, a responsibility of the wide players too to help out. But we get ran down the sides far too easily, and you know, I, I think that with Jones, it's it's more of a case of you know we know what he's about, and yet we we still pick him, and yet the likes of you know Matthews, who I thought was much better than him, I know that he's had his like moments been awful, but he's he's contributed more than like Jones has, and yet mm. one manager goes out, a cat and ball is straight in again, and that for me is a big a concern. It kind of says that, you know, there's a core there who influence who picks the team. You know, it's like they mm. almost pick themselves and then the team's picked like around them. And that for me is a concern when you're seeing players in the team who don't merit anything. And this thing with with, with like Steele, you know, like obviously we, we saw for weeks that like Jason Steele was doing very, very badly. He didn't do anything to actually deserve to be recalled to the like side in the like first place. Um, yeah, he comes in and and I always thought to myself at that time, a catamol's influence there, you know, the are both local lads, both from the, the same sort of like area. Did he join this kind of like clique which got him in the Ooh. team? And that was uh, that was something that, you know, occurred to us. You obviously can't really say it for certain, so you don't right. want to actually say it. But I think that it's a concern. I really, really do. It's an interesting one. Certain. I mean, if it is a, if if there is any truth to that or if there is anything to that, then it would be a huge concern. It'd be a massive problem. And you're right, I completely agree with you. The, I mean, there's not a single Sunderland fan that's going to sit here and say that the idea of the players picking themselves or being bigger than the manager like that that's a good thing i don't think you find a you won't find many football fans in general who'd agree with that who, who would say that it's a good idea that is a huge concern and that's just one of the many many concerns this club have but i think yeah that's something that i would love to see in january i'd love to see it's something i'd love to see at the club anyway a root and branch review i'd love to see the whole thing pulled out and put back in again properly but if it has to be in the dressing room alone, so be it. You know, I'd love to get rid of these players. It's Catamol and John O'Shea. John O'Shea in particular, I've got to say about John O'Shea again, because 
people get they they give John O'Shea an easy ride in my eyes. I don't know why. You know, I know for a fact that he's well thought of around the club in general. I know that he's well thought of as a person. I know he's a very charitable person. He's a very generous guy, personable. He's all fantastic. These are all great things. You know what I mean? Good for him, blah, blah, blah. Who really cares, though? Because at the end of the day, it's not about that. It's not about fostering lovely feelings uh, in every walk of life, which, again, is only speculation whether he actually does that or not. It's, it's about what happens on the pitch. It's about what happens in the dressing room. And John O'Shea, I mean, there was an interesting point. Callum McKay, you haven't heard from him in a while, but something in particular that he said about John O'Shea yesterday, about how this man wasn't even particularly well thought of by Manchester United when we got him from Manchester United. He was a reserve utility player, essentially. And he has never, ever excelled for us. He's never excelled for this team. He's had some really good moments in games. I don't think John O'Shea has ever had a fantastic game. I think he's had some really good spells in games where, in my eyes, he just so happens to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, for whatever reason, he doesn't belong here. I don't know what he did to earn a contract extension other than simply being there when we ran out of money and couldn't think of anyone else to buy or couldn't attract anyone else to that position. But this whole idea, and I mean, I know his hat was tossed into the ring, the about being the manager, that's obviously not going to happen. I don't think, I think you'd be a bit mad to think that's a possibility. Um, nevertheless, the fact that it's talked about, he has done all of his coaching badges and things like that. I think a lot of people expect that sort of thing, but we should have a lot more... Um, we should have a lot more, well, optimism, but we should we should try and be more creative in our decisions, you know what I mean, with, with managers. We should, obviously, we spoke a little, we'll talk a bit now about it, but we spoke a little bit in the pod last time. Didn't want to speculate too much then because it was obviously it's just a, a rumour merry-go-round. But at the moment, it still is pretty much. There's no been no solid movement so far. I mean, looking at, what is it, Paul Hurst, the name's been banded about quite a bit, Gav, that anyone you know something about? I, I only know about Paul like. <laughs> yeah, I, I only know as much as what I've read. Um, we did a really good feature on the site about him. One of the writers who contributes to the site, James Nichols, he um, he he spoke to uh, fans of Grimsby, fans of Shrewsbury, Boston, the teams he's managed. Obviously, they're all a lot smaller than Sunderland are, and it's a, it's a bigger task walking into a club like Sunderland is one of those. But all of those people that he spoke who had nothing but praise to uh, give for Paul Hurst talking about how uh, how disciplined he is how um, obviously in the, in the case of Grimsby in the case of Shrewsbury he took them from you know relegation for that to success you know Shrewsbury he took over them last year bottom of the league they're now top currently of League One uh, which is why he's obviously being linked to, to jobs like Sunderland because you know natural to look down the leagues and say a team doing well and think oh he, may, he could maybe do a job yeah Everything about the appointment actually makes sense in my eyes because I don't think we've got a lot of money. None of the free agent managers out there presently really interest me or you know strike me as better than what we've had in Grayson. None of the none of the the other names link really inspire us at all. I'm mean, you're seeing the likes of Ali McCoist. Oh, she is the the, the favourite with the bookies, but that's just not happening. I don't know who genuinely thinks they'd give the job to John O'Shea, but that's not going to happen. But everything about the the Hurst appointment would make sense really because he's. He's the type of manager who would walk into a club like this and, and he wouldn't stand for it, really, is, is what I'm hearing. Uh, stand for, you know, the ill discipline of the players. I mean, the, the, the issue is that he, he isn't experienced at a big club, nor as a, not as a player or a manager. Mm. He only ever played for Rotherham. Uh, he spent his whole career there. But, you know, you've got to kind of look at what he's done at these smaller clubs and recognise that he could really could do with a step up. And he might, you know, we, we, we'll look at the likes of Eddie Howe now and Sean Dice. These are managers being linked with top jobs now certainly in Dyche's cases a lot of people want to see him go to Everton those were managers that clubs like Burnley and Bournemouth took a gamble on a couple of years ago and we've never done that I don't think I think you, you could maybe uh, make a case for Gus Poye but there's a man who had a really good club career in England and people knew who he was we've never really took a punt on, a, on an unknown yeah. name who's making a name for themselves in, in the lower leagues and I think if we're going to if we move away from making you know name appointments which I think we'll have done to an extent with Grayson but if we're going to move away from making name appointments I can't think of many better than Hurst currently who you know he's doing well so let's just see how it plays out I've got a feeling the club are probably not going to be looking at a manager down the leagues they're probably going to bring in someone that Bain already knows that's maybe why we're hearing Ali McCoy's name crop up in the press which oh, worries God, me immensely please, because you. Rangers fans is, he's a legend at that club but I mean uh, that last 18 months or so at Rangers was horrific with McCoy's and I don't think 
he's got a lot in the bag. Really, he's not he's not achieved anything as a manager in my eyes. So, oh God, I hope it's not. But let's see how it plays out. I guess. Well, it's an interesting one. I completely <laughs> I feel your pain there. No one wants to see McCoy's in charge. I agree. He's not a manager I've ever really rated. Um, with regards to the way everything panned out from the end at Rangers, difficult situation, I think. But then again, I was going to say it's a topic. It was a toxic atmosphere and things like that. But I mean, what's he what's he going to be walking into at Sunderland? Do you know what I mean? It's hardly Rose's here. Um, in general. I would say when it comes to the search for a manager, I mean, I've already said this, but Bain should be doing everything he can to secure the best manager for the club. And it's interesting. We'll talk a little bit about um, the the rare appearance that Ellis Short made in an interview for the fans the other day. Um, but I think both of these people, Bain and Short, should be pulling their fingers out, essentially, because this is it. You know, if there have been, there have been some backs to the wall moments for Sunderland and they seem to have come back to back funnily enough seems to have happened one after the other or after the other particularly the last two years this is a situation now where we can't mess this up like we've already made perhaps the one mistake we could afford to make this season um in bringing in Grayson I mean to talk about Grayson for a moment I don't think he was actually that bad a manager at the end of the day I think he was completely unprepared unprepared overwhelmed or do you know what I mean? There's a lot of different reasons that he wasn't a good choice for manager. Nevertheless, regardless of why it didn't pan out, um, Bain made that decision. He made that decision. Ellis Short made that decision. They decided who to bring in. They canvassed everyone. They studied everyone's CV, presumably. They went through everybody's ideals and ambitions, you would hope. And they came up with Grayson. That's an interesting point, though, isn't it? Like, we're, we're sitting here hoping that the two people who have the power to effectively change things around for the club. We're sitting here hoping that they make the right choice, but they haven't in a long time. There's a, the, the, it's, I don't know. It's an interesting point, isn't it? It's hard to, it's hard to really quantify it. The, the reality is though, that if somebody has a track record of making poor decisions and making mistakes, you shouldn't rely on them or rather you shouldn't have to rely on them to make them make the correct decision. You know, that's, that's deemed as an unreliable person even if it is only in one regard. Ignoring everything else I feel about Bain and Short right now, these managerial mistakes, um, they're, they're pretty damning and they're damaging, more importantly. Every time we do it, we, we create another problem. Every time we bring in a new manager and things go wrong, they have to be paid off, they have to be sent on their way, then we have to deal with the fallout from when they were here. Like I say, players like Aidan McGeady were clearly brought in specifically because Grayson was there. I mean, yes, it was an opportunity for a, a job. Yes, there's a possibility you could have got back into the Premier League. Um, but in truth, it was probably a lot of wheeling and dealing, you know what I mean, on the sidelines, as managers tend to do. There have been a lot of phone conversations and little meetings and things like that. And that's really bad for the club, because when you're talking about Aidan McGee, who now seems to be one of two or three players, and if we're lucky, that's three players, that each and every manager is now relying on, caretakers as well, is now relying on to convert game or convert opportunities into points. And he's not going to be able to do it. He's too, he's too long in the tooth for it. Yes, he will be able to pop up with a goal once every couple of games, maybe. Yes, he'll be able to do a little bit of trickery, but he hasn't got the pace to beat his man. Uh, he's got the skill to do it, but again, not the pace, so it's not much use. You know, All we're really getting out of Aidan McGeady right now is a few crosses and a few passes and the odd shot, and that isn't fair on him. That's because he's being relied upon in a role that isn't actually his to fulfil. He should be a winger. He should be allowed to be a winger. Do you know what I mean? He shouldn't have to cut inside and try and score goals. Like, he shouldn't have to do this. He should just be able to enjoy his remit without any kind of harassment or anything like that. But I digress. Point being, we can't keep making mistakes with managers because we will end up in much deeper uh, trouble than we were to begin with. I mean, let's talk for a moment about the Ellis Shaw interview. For those of you who aren't aware, I'm sure you all are aware because you're all Sunderland fans mostly. He um, popped up in an interview on SAFC.com. Um, this is quite rare. I'm, I'm actually not sure when the last time this happened was. Um, I mean, he spoke, he's only really spoken to the fans directly several times. I and mean, when it is, it's usually on the website in the form of a written statement, something that he's dictated, um, which is neither here nor there, I suppose. That's up to you if you want to think that's a good or a bad thing. But yeah, essentially, the, the interview to me, lots of different people took lots of different things from it. Um, the, the general consensus, obviously, seems to be uh, that he needed to do that. He absolutely needed to come forward and contact, make contact with the fans, communicate with the fans particularly with rumours going around about him selling, not selling, blah, blah, blah. And I appreciate that he sort of moved to clarify some things, moved to clarify the idea of perhaps why the club wasn't sold, even though the rumours, it, it pretty much matched the rumours that um, 
supposedly whoever the suitor was wasn't suitable for Sunderland. Um, apparently, we as fans wouldn't have been happy any happier with these guys than we are with Ellis Short. However, this takes me back to what I was just saying um, about reliability and who you can trust to make these decisions. And I personally don't trust Ellis Short to make that decision for the club. And I don't think that he has a, a track record to prove that he's capable of making the right decision for the club like that. Which is, the, which is the, it's, a, it's a great big paradox because he owns the club. Um, any kind of success we've had over the, now, over the last six years could technically be attributed to him. Equally, any problems we've had, any issues we've had should also be attributed to him. Um, we've seen what nine managers, or will this be our was Grayson our ninth manager? I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll we'll be seeing our ninth or tenth manager um, under him, and he's had opportunities to sell and hasn't done so because he believes that he's best placed to decide whether the club can go forward with another person or not. Now, Michael, um, what do you feel about about the interview in general? You'll agree it needed to happen. Absolutely. He, he needed to talk. And I think more so than actual answers, I think he needed to show fans that he's, he still actually cares, that he's mm. still invested on like some level. You know, I, I, I mean, you know, I mean, you have talked about Ellis Short a lot over the past. Uh, yeah. I think we've got a counter, uh, a counter views on it, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that Ellis Short is the issue at the club. I think, um, I think he needs to sell it. I think that he wants to sell it. Um, uh, it's one of them with Ellis Short, whereas I don't believe he's the wrong man for the club, but I also don't think that he's the right one. I think that there's mm. a much better person out there, someone who can um, who can give all of his time to the club. Because what annoyed me, uh, well, I, I wouldn't say annoyed, is what struck me about the uh, uh, like interview is that he said that um, he's spending more time on his other businesses in the US. Mm. And, you know, that's fair enough. I know that he's going to be a man with lots of different interests in, in all of this. But from a fan point of view, from a personal point of view, uh, uh, when it comes to my football club, I'm selfish. I want someone there who's going to who's gonna give it the absolute all, all of the time. That's going to be their obsession. That like making this mm. club great and running this club is going to be, you know, their thing. It's going to be what they do. It's going to be what they want to do more than anything else. And, and obviously, Ellis Shaw isn't in a position to be able to actually do that. So that's why uh, I, I think that I don't think he's the right man for us right now. But I don't think that he thinks he's the right man for us either. But, like now, I think I think that he thinks that you know his his time's at an end. That he's he's tried absolutely everything. That he's he's putting money, um, you know, just to keep us going, really, and it's not really worked. And I think that he's I think that he believes that he's the wrong man. I think that I think that he thinks that he's not particularly great at this. You know, I think that he thinks well, I've tried this and I've, and I've kind of shown that I can't actually do it. But the issue is mm. that that Ella Shaw, until someone wants to come and commit this the kind of money that that this club needs. Ella Shaw is what we've got. And, as, a, know, as, as a counterpoint it, it, to that, though, I mean, as we won't get too too into it, but you say hmm. um, Ella Shaw is what we need until we can get someone to come in who has the money to invest properly. But what, if hmm. he's not going to invest that money himself, hmm. then I mean, it would be fine if we could sort of maintain like a position in in any division. But since it looks like we're going down without that investment, could it not be argued that now is the time to sell if you're not going to put your money where your mouth is? Because essentially, he's going to have to stump up cash hmm. if we want to stay in the championship. I don't think that he's going to spend money on the team. Um, I think that he's going to mm. invest to uh, keep us uh, like float. But I think that the days of, well, certainly for now, the days of him investing a lot in the actual team are gone. Just yeah. And that's just because I think that a businessman in him is kind of like, is, is now in control. I think that he thinks that the club, if it's ever going to... Uh, I like improve is it needs to be able to wipe its own nose it needs mm. to be able to you know uh, to uh, finance itself first and foremost and any investment that he puts in is extra mm. rather than any investment that he puts in maintains the crap that we actually have and i think yeah. that the fact that the club can't finance itself i think that that's, that's actually held us back more than people realize i think that there's this massive uh, black hole that the money goes into that we don't actually uh, uh, like we don't actually get the good stuff from we don't we don't actually yeah. use it to uh, uh, like improve and of course in football we all know that if you uh, stand still then you, you go backwards and and yeah. El every penny that ellis short has like put in for maybe three or four years has been to make the club 
a, 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 like a standstill. So we've obviously uh, gone backwards. So I don't think that he's going to put in, like any money. And I think if we can get ourselves um, in a position where we can finance ourselves and uh, uh, stand on, on our own two feet, I think Ella Shaw might be then be more interested if he's still here in yeah. putting in money. But for yeah. now, he isn't, and that's and it, I, so I don't think he's he's what we need to actually move forward. Mm. Um, but I think that he's just what we've got, whether we like it or not. You know, so, I mean, the, the the thing about that, like, it's it's a good point you raise about it, and I, I sort of agree in a sense. Um, in that the businessman in him must be coming to the fore now and realizing that he, he can't keep throwing money away like this. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's, if he's not getting it, no one's seeing the benefit of it. Obviously, why bother? I completely agree with that in a sense. But that's that takes me back to this main point, though. He can't surely he can't stand as custodian over the club if he's unable to put in the money that will push us forward, but we are no longer standing still. Like if we stand still now, if the money isn't put into the club now and in January, we will get relegated to League One. And the reality of that, or well, the truth behind that is that he's the only man that can change that. And he can either do that by putting the money in from somewhere. Like even if it is one last ditch, even if he turns around and says, look, I'm not giving you any fucking money after this. This is bullshit. I shouldn't even have to be paying this and stumps up the money like that. Fair enough. Or he sells to somebody who is prepared to invest because in my eyes, standing still when we're going to be relegated to league one is it's tantamount to actually relegating us deliberately you know when when we know he has access to that money i completely agree that the club should be able to wipe its own nose it should be self-sustaining and that's obviously where that's obviously the remit that martin bain was given i think um that's becoming more apparent now obviously a lot of cost cutting in, but similarly as we become less and less um well as we, as we shrink essentially we're becoming less and less profitable uh, we're losing season tickets we're losing ticket sales in general there are lots of different things subscriptions and things like that that we could have capitalized on but didn't um that's my main concern here is that we aren't standing still like all of this would have been great if we were still 16th in the premier league that would have been fair i would have totally got it like i would understand and perhaps this did all start then perhaps that was when ellis short made the decision um to either sell the club to somebody who he truly believed would take it forward or not sell it at all but you can't say i'm not going to sell the club but i'm also not going to invest any money in it it's like the idea he's putting money in just to keep us afloat we aren't afloat anymore we aren't, well, we aren't think, afloat I, we're sinking i think that he would sell the club to someone who mm. would actually invest. I think that the difficulty is finding someone willing to actually invest the kind of like money that, that like this club needs. I mm. don't think that there's a lot of people out there. And I don't think that the club at the minute is that attractive to anyone to buy. And that, yeah. that is uh, Ellis Short's fault. Ultimately, it's Ellis Short's fault because mm. he's the one who's actually run it and taken it down here. Mm. But um, I think, I, I, I do honestly think that, you know, we can, I think that if he gets like a like huge offer from, from like someone and he comes out and says, I'm not going to sell, then I think that we've got every right as fans to kind of like say, well, hang on a minute. This is completely account of what you've said. You know, this is mm. holding us back. But I think that, you know, whilst there isn't anybody out there who's looking to actually like invest, I think you made it a quite a sort of like, you know, it was interesting what you said about the, the bid that we had in the summer. We said that no fans would have been happy with it. Um, I think that obviously we don't know what, uh, what it was, but from, you know, taking that on board, it looks like it was it was going to be a bad deal for the actual club in terms of the, the, the like finances, you know, that they wouldn't have actually had any more money than him to put in. They might have been a little bit a, a less willing to cover a, a, the like losses, you know. So I think mm. um, I, I'm not sure what we can take from the, you know, the news that we have had an offer in the past. I just think that there just isn't anybody out there at the minute who actually wants it. And I don't blame them. If I had... The kind of like money that that you know that was needed to actually save this club um, mm. and improve it. I don't think I would be spending it. I, I mean, I would because I'm a fan. But you know, if it was any other club, I don't think I'd be thinking, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll take that and I'll give that club all of my money." You know, it's absolutely no way. Well, I mean, it's interesting because if we speculate about how much the club is actually up for sale for and things like that, I mean, it's in total speculation. There was some some evidence to suggest it was up for around sixty million. Um, that's, I mean, obviously, I remember when Sunderland was valued at around 200 million, and it wasn't that long ago. And most clubs that exist in and around the Premier League 
<laughs> Sorry, whoops, we don't do that anymore, do we? But yeah, most clubs that were in the position that we were in, that we fell from, um, you would have thought that that was something that you could have sort of, that people would snatch your hands off, like snatch your hands off for clever investors. I mean, it does it not seem a bit unbelievable to anyone else that Sunderland is barely worth, not only barely worth £60 million, to, I mean, if you look at it like that, if someone wouldn't have, if someone would have come in before and taken the club for two hundred million, that wouldn't have included their investment. So now you look at the idea that you can not only buy the club, clear half of its debt, and invest a hundred million pounds into it if you sink two hundred million into Sunderland. To me, it just seems like it's a simple decision. Obviously, yes, I'm biased because I'm a Sunderland fan, as you say, and we would, wouldn't we? But. It just seems strange to me, considering the world-class facilities, considering uh, the fan base when it's actually on side, when it's actually being trekked properly. Um, yeah, it has a has a global marketability. Obviously, not as high as some of the bigger clubs. I don't know. It's just a. It, there's a lot of questions to be asked. There's a lot of pondering to do. Gav, what do you make of it all? The Ellis Short interview, the club, the whole shebang. <laughs> um, I found I found the interview a bit odd. Um, I don't really know how to take Ellis Short as a person because we don't hear enough from him um but i think he came off very passive aggressive i thought he he um proved a point in doing the interview clearly mm-hmm. um one of the first things he spoke about was the reporters and talking about people who talk about him um mm-hmm. and he you know it was maybe a bit of a, a bite back to the fact that people don't think he cares um i do think that when you make such an investment in something over a long period of time you can't help but care um and I agree to an extent with what Michael said, actually. I think I think that he probably does acknowledge within himself that he's not the right man. Um, he isn't going to sit in front of a camera with a club interviewer and tell us that. Yeah. But, you know, um, to a lay if he has, he had to do that that chat. Um, even if it's just to, to buy him and Martin Bain a little bit more time in what they're trying to do, which is obviously um, right a lot of wrongs and get this club, you know, operating on a smaller um, budget than what it has done for the last few years. Um, the issue I've got, I guess, is that he wasn't prepared to um well he you know he pretty much spelled out there's not going to be much investment in players um he didn't speak too much about you know who we're going to replace simon grayson with um <clears throat> which i think would have been beneficial if we'd spoke about what the next manager is going to be like or at least what they want to find in the next manager um some commitment from him about you know spending money getting the right man would have been good um you know we we made this point before but we don't expect something to be suddenly you know promotion contenders but it would be nice if the owner had come out and told us look um, we do realise this this club's in a perilous pos- position, and we need to we need to fund, uh, even if it's against you know what I feel uh, um, within my best wishes. I feel that we've probably got to fund a good manager and get the right man in place, rather than cutting costs and getting somebody because you know the um, the cheap. Uh, which I, I, like I spoke about earlier, I worry that we're going to bring in somebody who's just a, a, a you know a bit of a job jobs of the boys type thing, like a McCoy or somebody who's been around the doors a few times who hasn't really got the got the you know the battle within them to, to turn this club around. I fear that's what we're gonna go down because it's cheap. Um but I think I think short overall he had to he had to come out and say what he did because it's got the stage where there's you know fans are looking around for answers and there's nobody answering them. Um Martin Bain and Alice Short are the figureheads of this club whether we like it or not. When they come out and mm. speak we have to take notice because uh, and, and we have to scrutinise every word they say because I think um, when the do- when they speak so sparingly to us, or you know, when the only time we hear from them are in you know interviews with the with the club website, then we've got to take every word for what it is. And sometimes it's it's hard to you know relate to these people because the y- you always judge what they're saying with a with a bit of cynicism. I do anyway. Is that I don't I'm never warmed. To, I've warmed out short before. I think I think when when things were going particularly well. Um, well, I say particularly well, but when we've had when we've had my good days, people have looked to short and you know saw him as the man to get behind because he's he's come along mm. and invested all his money in the club. But obviously, over the last few years, that's died off considerably. And um, but throughout the entirety of the time Martin Baines has been here, I've never warmed to him. There's just something very very unlikable about him. We were warned by Glasgow Rangers fans what to expect, and you know, although initially I felt um, I could see what the the point in bringing the man like Baines to the club was, uh, I just think over time he's proven to be a very um, Appointment really, he's the man who is effectively running this club day to day. Although Ella Short signs off on big decisions, and I'm sure they work together on those. Um, mm. Martin Bain's the one running this club day to day, and you know, the next managerial appointment pretty much on him. I don't think Ella Short's going to be the man going out looking for the next manager. It's going to be Martin Bain. Um, if they get this next decision wrong, then they haven't a leg to stand on. Really, they are on the last slice, the pair of them, and 
the next appointment is the difference between us being a League One club next season and being a Championship club. So to to round off what I'm trying to say, I think I think Ellis Short has to make these um, appearances more regular, whether he likes it or not. Um, he needs to be more interactive with Sun and supporters, and I don't necessarily mean rocking up at fan liaison group meetings and branch branch uh, play. I don't mean that. What I mean is we need to hear more often from him. It can't just be a once every year occurrence. We need to hear that. You know, he is genuinely invested and cares, and he that he is day to day still involved. And we need to hear about what he's got plans for. And we need to hear about what he thinks of the way things are going. Um, because relationship that we've been lacking for a long time now, and if we can, if we can somehow get short to to speak more often, it will it will help a lot. It will help our situation a lot because currently we're in a bad place, and it's in a large part down to his decision making. Yeah, I mean that's that's the the crux of it, isn't it? At the end of the day, we've got. I mean, we've got a little bit of time left until we we play Millwall. We've got no time for you anymore on the episode, I'm afraid, guys. Um, but yeah, got a little bit of time until the next match. A um, little bit of a break, I think. In that time, Bane, if it is entirely Bane and Short, hopefully they need to be working their ass off to get a great manager in. I mean, we've said it before, but it, it is unlikely, isn't it? As we've said, it is unlikely. It's very unlikely to happen. We have no money. Don't have any money for players. God knows how much we have to pay Grayson to let him go. Every decision, this is the trouble with Sunderland. Every decision they make is an expensive decision, regardless of uh, whether it's the right one or not. Every single one seems to cost a lot of money. You know, when you're running a football club, it seems that every decision you make, every choice you, you're given is like a million pound choice. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? We can't do anything about that. Us lowly fans, we just have to sit here and hope and pray that everything turns out. So that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for joining us on this episode. Uh, don't forget, you can subscribe to us on Acast. You can subscribe on iTunes. Uh, iTunes? iTunes. You can subscribe on uh, YouTube, of course. And you can go see us on rockreport.com for some fantastic stuff from some of our writers. Uh, that'll be all for now and hopefully the next time we speak to you next week we'll have a new manager and a slightly more optimistic outlook on life that's the rogue report signing off